Good evening. I'm Courtney Graham with the Engagement Department at the Art Institute of Chicago. Welcome to this evening's virtual artist talk with the founders of the Ambiguous Standards Institute. First off, I'd like to thank Jay Frankie and David Hero. Ambiguous Standards Institute, an institute within an institute, is part of the Frankie Hero Design Series, which highlights significant design talent and makes exhibitions like this possible. We're so glad to have you joining us virtually, and while we wish that we could welcome you in person, we hope this digital format can offer a chance to stay connected to the Art Institute from home. We'll begin with a brief review of some of the features we'll be using today. This program will be shared in presentation mode, so we have turned off video and microphones for attendees. For optimal viewing, please select full screen mode under view options in the top right corner of your screen and you can adjust the size of the sliders by sliding the separator to the left or right. Throughout the presentation, you're invited to share questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. We look forward to answering some of those at the end of the presentation. Closed captions are available and can be turned on via the controls at the bottom of the screen as well. If you encounter any technical difficulties during today's program, again, please let us know in the Q&A and we'll do our best to assist you. This program is being recorded, so if you'd like to revisit it in the future, you'll be welcome to do so. We were honored to have architect Chan Su Jergen and designer Avshar Gupinar, founders of the Ambiguous Standards Institute, in conversation with Maite Borjabad, Neville Bryan, Associate Curator of Architecture and Design, and Zoe Ryan, the Daniel W. Dietrich II, Director of the Institute of Contemporary Art at the University of Pennsylvania. Our speakers will be joining us again live to answer your questions, but first we take you to their conversation. Enjoy. Good evening, everyone. I'm Maite Borjabat, Neville Bryan Associate Curator of Architecture and Design at the Art Institute of Chicago. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you today to celebrate the exhibition, Ambiguous Standards Institute, an institute within an institute. This is the third iteration of the Frankie Hero design series, which brings fantastic programming and leading voices in contemporary design to our audiences. And that has previously supported amazing solo shows by Christine Mainz Dersma and Max Lam. I want to personally extend my gratitude to Jay Frankie and David Hero for their ongoing support of the museum and specifically for the Department of Architecture and Design. Today, we have the honor of having with us Jansu Kurgen and Afsar Gurpinar, founders of the Ambiguous Standards Institute, along with Zoe Ryan, the Daniel Dietrich Director of the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia and former chair of the Architecture and Design Department at the Art Institute of Chicago. Together, the four of us, we will unpack this fantastic exhibition and the multiple levels. It makes us look at our most daily life objects and standards that we're surrounded by ranging from birth control pills, packets, and carry-on bags, to hand, ba to hand gestures, kitchen utensils, or items used during public protest. So let's start at the beginning. Ambiguous Standard Institute, which is the first part of the title of the exhibition. This is actually not only the exhibition title, but also the name of your studio. And that fully represents your practice in a very holistic way. I'm actually very interested in, in hearing about the research-based approach that you have towards design that is actually the base of your practice and also to learn the process of work that you have been developing for so many years now to unpack and craft this term of ambiguous standards that has become not only a specific outcome of a research but also a methodology in itself that crosses over all your practice and under which you have even founded the Institute, Ambiguous Standard Institute. Thank you very much for this kind invitation. We are honored and very excited to be here uh, today with you and talking about our uh, exhibition in Art Institute Chicago. Let's start by um, explaining, maybe giving a little uh, background information about how we operate as an institute. Mm -hmm. um, it is uh, not only, although we are the founders of, of this institute, it's uh, by no means a, a one person or two person operation. 
and we have uh, many people that are um, designing and, and creating and product producing with us. Uh, some of them are our uh, students, some of them former students, uh, graduates, uh, some of them uh, artists and professionals in their field. So uh, regarding uh, the, uh, uh, depending on what we are uh, doing uh, at that specific moment, uh, uh, people uh, become a larger part of our practice uh, and then uh, recede. Uh, so uh, we have been uh, working together and uh, exhibiting uh, since uh, it's our first installation in 2018 for the Istanbul Design Biennial. Mm -hmm. But as an institute, we have been working uh, with uh, with Jansu now from uh, 2014. Yeah. So basically, as an institute, uh, we um, somehow research the standards and uh, the standards that determine almost everything uh, from daily life to industry. And these are existing in various parts of our uh, life and the world. So these standards are sometimes very obvious and sometimes uh, they are quite hidden. And we approach this uh, strange fluid or fragmented nature of everyday life um, with some ambiguous methods in a way. Yes, uh, and uh, we cannot say we are uh, disorganized in any way, but uh, we can say we have a, a sophisticated and complicated way of working. It's not always very, very direct or it's not always uh, very clear uh, during the process what we are uh, trying to do, uh, what we are trying to achieve. There can be a secondary or tertiary even justifications of what we are doing but uh, what we do we almost uh, we always do with um, uh, precision and and seriousness and we work towards achieving uh, to provide a, a clearer understanding of the issues that are shaped around uh, these ambiguous standards um, hello, everyone. Um, I'd just like to take a minute to also thank Jay Frankie and David Harrow uh, for um, establishing the Frankie Harrow Design Series. It's really a fantastic program at the Art Institute, and I had the honor of working on the first three shows. I want to also thank Maite for being such a fabulous um, collaborator on this exhibition, and of course, to Janzu and Avshar for be being just such incredible insightful and generous um, designers to work with. Um, it's been such a pleasure and uh, thank you for entrusting your work to us. Um, I met, I think John Zou and Afsha, we met in 2014 when I was working on the Istanbul Design Biennial. Um, and already then I found your approach absolutely fascinating. Um, and we've kept in touch and I really loved how you approach design theory, but also practice. Um, and also your ideas around especially research-based practice and thinking of curating and the curatorial project. And it's one of the things when I saw um, the Ambiguous Standards Institute and your work first at the 2018 um, Istanbul De Design Biennial, and you're seeing images on your screen um, from that installation, mm -hmm. I was immediately captured um, just by the intensity of the project but also how interesting it was as, a, um, as an idea, a way of interrogating not only pressing concerns and really important issues within society, but also really questioning the field of curating and the practice of design itself, um, asking questions about what constitutes research um, or the curatorial project um, and how we can bring that into the exhibition space. And I love how you question standards, um, as you call them, ambiguous standards or non-standard standards to interrogate how the world is constructed. Um, and I thought um, when we first started talking about bringing the project to the Art Institute, you know, for me, it was it was important as a platform to really for you to be able to really develop the project. And I remember you being very excited, not only about that opportunity, but also about the opportunity to bring this practice to Chicago, but also especially to the context of the Art Institute. And I wondered, well, I'd love to hear more about, 
yeah, what what was so interesting about that opportunity and what it, what has it provided you to um, in terms of developing your own practice? Thank you so much, Zoe. Um, it's, a, again, a great honor for us to uh, situate inside of one of the galleries of Art Institute Chicago. And um, as you mentioned, uh, we started out um, exhibiting with Design by Anil in Istanbul under the curatorship of Jan Bolen and her, his team. And uh, from the moment uh, onwards, we always imagined an institute that is traveling. Uh, that is uh, traveling and uh, making new showcases in different and even distant places. So from that moment on, we envisioned and dreamed about also uh, having different branches in all over the world. Uh, within the scope, our first chance was to uh, do this travel uh, with, uh, with the curatorial team invitation to uh, France in the scope of Luma Art and also to Belgium, uh, to Simai. And this uh, group of exhibition uh, derived, or, or let's say collected from the collection of the Biennial uh, was our first um, two stops. These were our first two stops. So then um, by um, suggesting a new crate, that means a new discussion topic, uh, we participated individually to Jerusalem Design Week uh, the same year. And this time we bring uh, forward a new discussion on the ambiguous standards of electricity. Uh, so as you see in, on the images, uh, these crates are um, somehow curated uh, debates. And we are using different um, meta methodologies, uh, to be honest, uh, when we gather these collections. Uh, what we do first is to make an archive and then uh, by curating this archive, uh, we bring forth some hidden maybe or latent um, discussions and qualities uh, embedded in standards. So in a sense, uh, building an archive is a key feature for us. And when we situate it first um, in Art Institute, which is uh, not a biennial, which is not a temporary uh, space, uh, it is, indeed a very um, institution, the, the heart of the institution. So um, making an exhibition within an institute, institution, which is a quite serious one, and the collection is immense, uh, was altogether a different uh, um, experience for us. Yes, uh, probably uh, the, the major uh, transformation the Institute has experienced was in 2018. So the exhibition you are seeing now uh, in the Istanbul Design Biennial was actually the result of these uh, four years of uh, research and writing and thinking and discussion. So uh, the, the, the year before the Design Biennial uh, has actually went with intense discussions with, with Jan Bolan. Mm -hmm. uh, we have started the Institute with uh, first uh, actually making a list, ma writing down the ambiguous standards we encounter in daily life, like I'll be there in no time uh, or uh, the size of a matchbox, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but, um, and, and we have uh, arrived at this uh, physical manifestation of uh, of these uh, ideas, issues uh, like uh, the food or time or electricity and uh, all the other crates that we are exhibiting now in uh, AIC. Uh, and uh, the, the physical man manifestation was these crates. And each crate is then uh, a collection or a curation of uh, different objects, um, which is uh, initiating debate. Um, around these uh, these issues, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, well, and and also we um, the difference here between the uh, the design biennial and the Ike exhibition is that uh, we are, as the name suggests, we have really um, taken up to this challenge of relating ourselves uh, to the institute itself. Uh, by not only uh, producing several crates, 
but uh, thinking about the content, thinking about the audience, thinking about the collection and the structure and uh, maybe the principles of the uh, Art Institute of uh, Chicago uh, during this process. And uh, in means of uh, tasks, there were many different tasks were involved in the making of this uh, exhibition from uh, video shooting to text editing, to writing, to graphic design and product design and digital manufacture and so on. So the curatorial work was indeed very layered uh, because it is for the first time we are, we are uh, responsible for the whole uh, design of the exhibition, which also um, brings us uh, a certain responsibility being situated in a very serious institution and uh, being the um, creators of the crates, but also the exhibition. Uh, therefore, th there are many layers that maybe we can uh, talk through, but uh, as Arshar uh, summarized, I mean, we deal with um, the minute detail of the um, pedestals where in which we place the crates or the graphical uh, design and their, I don't know, somehow organization and also um, many other issues. The installation. So uh, in a sense, we are situated in a very, um, let's say delicate place, which is a gallery, and uh, this this is one of the challenges maybe uh, for us. And the the other challenge could be the uh, different standards of U.S. soils. I mean, the electricity is different uh, than our country. Uh, the plugs, the measurement system is different. So, in a sense, we already experienced the the ambiguity of the standards firsthand. I would love to go back to some of those um, concepts that uh, you just shared. When, when you talk about the, building this archive of standards, right? Ultimately you're tracing all these standards um, and it seems as a very simple exercise, but by gathering and tracing all these standards, you're actually opening up and reveal, revealing uh, kind of a hidden network of power, right? As for instance, specifically like the example of the electricity crate precisely reflects just on the simple object of the outlet. It, reflect, it reflects the, the powers that remain and are performed and retained through the colonial project, right? Of the influence of uh, countries colonizing other countries and just by noticing that into the daily element of the electricity outlet. So in a way, when, when, you, when the audience approaches your exhibition, identifies these multiple layers. And it's something that I really love about this exhibition because it makes a manageable approach to huge political issues, precisely for this careful layering and of all the elements that are playing together in the in the gallery, right? And that comes as not as a coincidence, since I know that for you, this uh, methodological approach of um, collecting objects, analyzing them, analyzing the standards, and seeing how that affects every daily routine and how that daily routine is connected to huge political powers, it has to do also with a deeply interest in in pedagogy, right? So somehow you, you've you used this methodology not only for these projects that could be exhibitions or research, but also within your students, right? And even the idea of the crate and, and the design is on itself a way of concealing into one crate, one specific uh, standard under scrutiny and isolating it from kind of an interconnected um, layer of, of elements, right? So it's somehow the, the crate, which is could be called the display device, it's also um, helping to frame these entanglements through which design crosses over multiple disciplines. So I, I would really love to hear a bit more about that and the, the relevance of, the, of these crates as pedagogical tools and the connection within the exhibition device that you already briefly mentioned before. So one approach is to collect the uh, objects. And upon this collection of objects, we create a debate, we conceptualize it and create an archive first. And the other one is to um, suggest first the debate itself and find the related objects of the debate. So in that case, 
when we talk about the standards of time um, and duration as a part of it, uh, we are collecting different um, objects of, um, let's say, communicating through or, or for time issues. Mm -hmm. Would you like to say something? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it, it is never um, like this, like the uh, idea first reaches uh, the perfect um, maturity and then we began uh, begin with the crate it's always like the, for the for the food crate we were thinking that uh, all the chicken eggs were all the healthy chicken eggs were okay to, to be sold in the supermarkets but as time as we have started to collect them we have realized there are like hundreds of uh, different chicken types and only maybe the uh, one percent of the whole chickens eggs are uh, co qualified for the uh, commercial uh, sales. You know? mm -hmm. uh, so the same thing happened with the time. So we are starting with the time and we are starting with the, with these phrases forever and ever in matter of time uh, or um, in, the blink of an eye. in the blink of an eye, New York seconds. Uh, so many things are actually, so many uh, uh, expressions have penetrated our language. And so we have started from there, uh, but as we move, move on, we have felt the need of uh, acquiring, again, creating objects. Like we, we need uh, some objects to show our relationship to time and show our uh, temporal, uh, temporality. Um, so then we have collected together these objects, different watches, clocks, uh, uh, prayer clocks or uh, park meters or um, reception bells and so on. And, and we have realized that we are entering um, into this realm of uh, human perception of temporality. Um, and so uh, uh, so this, this second uh, part, although these two crates are so different from each other, they show uh, we are also in a process of, of learning and going deeper and deeper into the issues uh, themselves. Yeah. So in a sense, uh, we, we first start uh, by building up an archive and um, looking at the objects, which are quite banal and uh, quotidian in a sense. And we try to see uh, what can be said uh, beyond the conventions and what are the hidden dimensions or relations uh, that maybe at first glance we just skip. So um, maybe we can also say that this is kind of an attempt of making an archaeology of today. I'd love to pick up, up on that and also something that Maite um, brought up in terms of the pedagogical approach to your work or perhaps the kind of you said that you're always learning through through your projects and I feel like I'm both learning but also unlearning through through your work um, and also the idea I think what makes your your work so interesting is also its banality these are often very mundane ordinary objects that you're showing um, but when shown together they bring forward things as 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 might have said as you said um, these latent or um, invisible systems, networks or standards, the kind of codes, the quantities, the qualities that obviously dictate and inform how we understand the world. Um, you are both professors and you actively teach. And I, I wonder if that, and I'm sure it has some kind of, it's inflected very much in, in, the, in the way that you practice and the way that you bring people together and the way that you talk about, you talk about your work. Um, but you also use, I think what's interesting about that is you, you draw from many different types of um, formats and display mechanisms in the exhibition as a way to engage audiences in this process of learning or, un or unlearning. Um, some of them, like the crates, are obviously very inspired by modernist approaches to, to education and learning. The posters, which we're seeing here in the image, have a long history of um, being a form of propaganda or protest. 
um, the mic, which is the information center or the information box at the beginning of the of the exhibition, um, where you're you're both standing there and kind of explaining the, the project to us. Um, these all, I think, are really interesting techniques and different um, ways of really, yeah, engaging audiences in a conversation. I'd love to hear more about how you conceived of, of the exhibition, but also through thought about these kind of hierarchy, the, the layers of display methods that are at work in the, in the show. Sure. Um, yeah, so these were the objects that, uh, as you also um, underlined, um, the ban they're banal. Uh, maybe you can find uh, many of which in these uh, $1 shops. And so they are not unique at all. But when we uh, co compile them together under a, a certain debate, they um, say something larger than their um, individual uh, existence. So uh, this is a part of our pedagogy, I guess, uh, the, the thing that we follow, because we are looking now um, the object that relates, uh, that operates actually uh, in the capillaries of society, in the capillaries of uh, power or capitalistic relations or consumption habits. So in a sense, um, this is kind of an uh, attempt to bring awareness to our immediate environment, to our immediate, uh, let's say, interaction uh, with the object. Um, the pedagogical part is uh, really important. Um, I mean, the the, the agit posters or uh, the uh, vacuum uh, crates uh, were mostly used for a for a very specific and distinct ideology and for the indoctrination of this ideology, uh, as uh, the ambiguous standards institute uh, we should say that we are not um you know entirely dreaming about a, a world without any standards like we are not advocates of ambiguous standards or we are not uh cursing the absolute standards by no means we are just trying to understand how all of this is uh, intertwined into each other how everything is interconnected uh, so we are borrowing, uh, let's say, these ideas from um, from the constructivists or from the uh, mid 20th century German um, institutes, uh, but we are not using it to uh, indoctrinate an idea. Uh, the The arrival at uh, using the crates uh, or having the crates uh, for the institute actually came with the um, with the uh, imagination um, that these could be traveling to schools to uh, reach uh, young people and children and uh, talk about uh, these issues because all of these things are not, like none of these things are things that you really learn in, in primary school or in uh, high school or anywhere. Uh, so talking about time, talking about uh, standards of gesture and health and tune and protest. All, we think all of these things are important and uh, and the structure of the exhibition then should be something that is, you know, uh, portable, mobile and uh, relate to various senses as well. So you can be uh, engaged with, uh, with this exhibition on different layers you can look at the posters you can watch the video mm -hmm. or you can be interested in the crates you, if you want more information you can go to the information center and learn more about the institute and maybe later in the uh, in the future all of these materials can be uh, uh, transported somewhere else and exhibited again or the crates can be closed and sent to schools uh, and then uh, used as uh, tools of uh, education. Yeah, so this um, installation that welcomes you when you enter the gallery, uh, we call it as MIC, uh, and it, it means a mass monolithic information center. Uh, we put our virtual presence inside, uh, almost like uh, teachers of the class. But obviously, this is just an orientation video just to make sense about the environment and 
uh, what we are dealing with as, an, uh, as a group of people um, that call themselves as institutions. So going back to that idea you mentioned at the beginning on how you first started collecting concepts and then you moved into starting collecting objects, right? And surely you've been doing this for many years as now the crates that we find are very deliberate into the selection of objects and how this combination of objects allows very specific questions. Um, I would like to hear a bit more about the crate of protest because this specifically shows how contextual these daily life objects are, how loaded of, of terms and ideas can be and how those loaded concepts attached to objects can also be mobilized really fast, even in time, changing the meaning and relevance and power of these uh, objects. Sure. So um, in this protest object, this is one of the uh, crates that we designed uh, for this exhibition uh, specifically. And again, it is contextualized according to the, um, let's say, um, the agenda of these protests. And so therefore, maybe uh, this time of the year, some of these objects are not that relevant anymore, but it is important to keep track of the, let's say, the time and the events. So in a sense, um, it, the ones that you see again uh, are the, um, the, the banal ones, uh, the ones that you can find in every shop. So that is what makes them uh, very valuable. That is uh, how they become contextualized easily. So let's take, for example, uh, a yellow umbrella. Uh, it, it is uh, somewhat loaded uh, in terms of its uh, daily meaning uh, differently in Hong Kong than the rest of the world. So it become, uh, became the symbol of the, um, this yellow umbrella movement of uh, Hong Kong uh, people. They use it uh, widely during their protests. Uh, so it, it, it happened to this, this um, let's say, this extent uh, that now it's not uh, possible to buy this uh, very specific type of yellow umbrella even on digital uh, shopping platforms. In Hong Kong. So they have a very strong political um, connoissance mm -hmm. and also very specialized uh, in terms of um, symbolizing the protests. So on one hand it becomes that uh, ubiquitous because it was at the first place it, it was being uh, sold in these uh, shops like I don't know um, the convenience stores. Mm -hmm. So and you know, the climate of Hong Kong is very um, tropical yeah, and so humid yeah. and rainy. So it's inevitable for people to carry on uh, umbrellas. And once you find the version that is widely available in chain stores, then it becomes an object in the hands of masses. And these masses are the protesters. So, and in this context, it becomes a very strong uh, political symbol. Likewise, um, they also have different meanings. I would like to share a personal, um, let's say, experience in that point. Um, the one that you see on the crate, the uh, pots and pans are very, um, again, widely used uh, in different cult cultures, in different countries, protest different things. Uh, so much so that in Turkey, um, recently, at, uh, with the beginning of the COVID pandemic, it has been used at uh, nine o'clock uh, p.m. Uh, to, to support the uh, health workers. So everyone was going uh, to the windows and flashing this, uh, put some pans and make noise for their support to health workers. And just a week after that, these very objects started to be used uh, to protest this time uh, and intervention to a university's dean selection process. So you need to keep track of everything because just within a week or so in the same geography, the meaning of the object changes very, very rapidly. And you really cannot be sure about its meaning as well. And uh, all these objects are derived from uh, different protests all over the world. 
and we just uh, try to give some background information about their origins and uh, in which protests, in which countries and when they had been uh, useful. So this is basically how things uh, can get contextualized uh, in this level of everyday you know, experienced life. Jansu, that's just so fascinating to hear. Um, I'm really interested, maybe we could, I could take you back to how you founded the institution, maybe uh, um, the, the sort of the, the origin story in a way. Um, you even call yourselves institutions, um, the kind of the collective that works together. And today when so many of us who work in institutions are really rethinking our roles and responsibilities, um, in a real time of, of radical change um, and with a necessary reckoning of our social, cultural, political systems and the, and the very foundations um, of these. I think it gives your work, um, you know, an added intensity um, and, and it takes on new resonance, especially in this moment, um, encouraging to us to look closely to look deeply to not take for granted those sort of things that are are everywhere all around us i wondered what um in this context what inspired you to start an institute um and what historical precedents you were really informed by but also you how you see the role of ambiguous standard institute really challenging conventions um and notions of how organizations can be formed um, but also this idea of yourselves as a collective practice. Yeah. So, uh, of course, we are not the first ones, obviously, to put uh, objects in boxes. Uh, it has been done many times in different uh, contexts or uh, framing things or bringing same type of things together. Uh, but uh, maybe the first main influence uh, should be and needs a separate mention. It's uh, a Turkish author, Ahmet Hamdi Tampanar, uh, who wrote a book in the um, uh, first half of the 20th century, 1954, it was published. Uh, it's called the Time Regulation Institute. And here he actually questions the, uh, the temporality of the uh, Turkish culture uh, and stemming from centuries ago, uh, moving through the Ottoman Empire and then uh, trans, uh, transiting into uh, the new republic who has a whole different type of understanding of the time. So uh, there, he actually, he talks about this office of the Time Regulation Institute, um, which actually knows, doesn't know what to do in the beginning. And they kind of um, find their own uh, interests and find their own job um uh later on so um the this uh, this uh, was a main uh, influence on us because uh, although all these national and transnational um uh, uh, institutions exist like the iso and turkish standards institute and uh, ansi and uh, 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 um, Deutsche Institute for Norman. Uh, although these exist, there is nothing that really looks into the uh, ambiguous ones. So uh, from the real life, these are uh, some uh, fictional and non-fictional institutions that has affected us. But uh, if we move into the uh, context of uh, art and design, uh, we can say, First of all, as we have mentioned, uh, the German work on the idea itself, uh, putting things into create to be used as pedagogical tools um, uh, to learn about things is, is a high influence. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, the, uh, the uh, uh, Minamosin Atlas by uh, A.B. Warburg, uh, the Archaeology of the Present Times uh, by, by Vajiro in the 1920s, um, the shadow boxes of Joseph Cornell, which um, a couple of which uh, the Art Institute of Chicago also uh, has in its collection. Um, the fluxes boxes, um, the pasta pursuit cases, uh, the movie series by uh, Peter Greenaway, but actually a multimedia project. Um, artistic works uh, or 
uh, the actual initiatives, such as the mass observation in 1937, um, and even the uh, Ministry of Strange Walks by uh, Monty Python uh, sketch from the 1970s. Um, so all of these different approaches, let's say, to, to objects, to cataloging, to archiving, to uh, um, um, bringing together um, to, uh, to create a new uh, say or a statement from the accumulation of the objects, uh, all of these are um, are inspirations for us, without doubt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as as we approach the end of the conversation, I wanted to go back to the very title again, but this time to the second part of the title, uh, an institute within an institute. So you have been speaking about collecting and how every crate is somehow an exercise of collecting things with a very specific agenda, right? To create that moderated discussion. And in that way, you, you are bringing your own collection of objects into the museum where they are actually merging within the museum's collection. And that speaks a bit to the idea of an institute within an institute. And actually uh, at the end of the gallery, there is a video that uh, was actually created specifically for this exhibition where you brought together some of your own objects with works from the Art Institute collection. So in this gesture, I, I wonder first what, you know, like interesting findings and connections or unexpected connections you, you found out because some of these as um, gatherings of objects, you've been with them for a really long time, but, but when you gather those with extra objects, in this case, from really different periods, what new ideas came? And the other question that comes to mind is like, in a way you're presenting us with daily objects that somehow we can have in our own kitchen that morning before we enter the museum. And somehow that object gets redignified, right? It gets treated as an artwork. And mm -hmm. that exercise, uh, really puts a different value into how we look at, the, at those objects. And after you leave the exhibition, actually, at least that happens for me after spending so much time in the space with your objects, your, with your assortment of objects, then you go back into other galleries in the museum and start wondering, right? Like how those things came together. And some of those objects were daily objects, actually from different periods, right? So this multi-layer approach, it starts to also create these multiple tentacles that connect within the, the museum and the whole effect gets amplified by accumulation. So I would love to, to hear what was your experience in, in that sense, how much of that you anticipated at the beginning when facing this idea and how much you discover uh, while actually doing it and navigating through the collection. Yeah, so thanks. Thank you for this question. I think it's one of the um, challenges that we faced from the start when we uh, first started to discuss uh, the exhibition with Zoe. We always wanted to situate ourselves uh, not just like a guest in the gallery space, but uh, really somehow finding an interaction uh, between the, the institute that we are situated in and our institute that be also uh, bringing together with our uh, items, objects, and collections. So uh, in a sense, this video work that uh, we have a still image from uh, this video, uh, this video work was quite, um, uh, let's say, um, let me start again. Mm -hmm. uh, this video work uh, draws a parallel between the collection of uh, Art Institute and uh, the collection of uh, ambiguous standards. Um, so the images that we select are from the archive of, uh, of the Institute. And I think the um, museum made a very generous uh, gesture by opening up their archives to online access so that we were uh, able to um, research and uh, find very related uh, artworks from the archive. As an, as an institution believing in the uh, interconnectedness of everything, uh, it would be a shame not to look at the Art Institute of Chicago's uh, collection. 
and uh, when uh, Zoe and the, uh, I mean the ins uh, the institute has provided us uh, with the with the, with the access to the um, collection, we we didn't only look at the um, uh, design and architecture uh, collection, but the the whole collection because uh, many of the objects we are exhibiting they are of course uh, designed in one way or another, uh, anonymous or not, but um, they, are, they are not artworks per se uh, by themselves. So we had to look at the whole collection and we have gathered um, uh, uh, artworks, uh, everyday objects, uh, a kind of, a, for example, a teapot from uh, the Ming period or um, a photograph uh, from uh, from a kitchen um, in Havana, let's say, mm -hmm. um, uh, artworks, uh, design works, everyday objects, maybe objects which were quite quotidian in their own time, as our objects uh, today. Mm -hmm. So um, this is also this also enables these uh, different levels of engagement with the exhibition. So as the as the audience, as uh, as the visitor, you can just look at the video mm -hmm. and and continue with uh, your um, mm -hmm. uh, viewing, or you can really go inside the collection and uh, look and try to find these objects or uh, uh, learn more about their artists and so on. And so this can open up a, a new a whole new um, area of engagement with uh, with everyday life. So this is what we would like to do, uh, actually. We would like also to uh, question the idea, the issue of value of things. I mean, certain things that we are displaying uh, are now um, maybe um, around us for their use values. But when you face with them in a museum space, and uh, if you see the similar uh, objects from the archives, it also... Uh, somehow elevated to the um, status of having a really uh, important exchange value or artistic value. So again, the value is also quite ambiguous in a way. Exactly. So uh, after um, we um, we have decided to to have this show, we're getting the invitation from Zoe, and then uh, starting the work. Uh, thinking about like what she ever do. Uh, so the planning process mm -hmm. went as planned. And for that, we didn't need to be in the, in the same place, you know? Uh, so we were having, um, although we had the time difference, we were having meeting uh, with Zoe, but then um, something uh, weird happened. I mean, uh, almost uh, uh, at the time we were going to open the uh, the exhibition uh, we have learned that the uh, mm. that we cannot <laughs> do it because uh, because of the pandemic mm. so uh, then we had the um, question of like whether we are going to have it or not whether it's going to be postponed uh, to be postponed to when was it going to be cancelled uh, so many yeah. questions and then um, so we ha only had the, the, the postponement but then uh, uh, Zoe uh, changed jobs. Mm -hmm. Then uh, also we had we had the pleasure to get uh, get to know Maite, and then we have started to work with Maite. And all the production uh, here, actually in Istanbul, uh, on, uh, went uh, under the conditions of the pandemic situation. So uh, and also the installation on the other side, as you, as you can see from Maite, uh, was like true uh, Zoom talks. And um, actually just uh, two days before uh, the opening in, in November, uh, the planned opening of November, uh, Maite learned that the uh, museum is going to be closed in uh, two days. Uh, so <laughs> she closed all the crates and uh, went out. So then we had to wait for... Uh, until February, and uh, almost like after one year of, of this planning and long distance uh, calls and um, production and shipment and everything, uh, we were able to open it. And uh, we are very happy that 
people can actually go there and physically be in the gallery uh, to to experience uh, these physical objects. <laughs> no. So without knowing it, we actually designed a, an exhibition which is very suitable uh, for pandemic situations. Uh, we have our virtual presence in the gallery so that we don't need a personal interaction and uh, everything can be um, closed and um, able to move. Uh, so um, in this exhibition was uh, also a learning process for us. And I guess uh, we were so lucky that we learned uh, many things from the best museum professionals in the world. And uh, for that, we are always um, grateful to you all. Thank you so much, uh, Jansu and, and Afsar. And as we have commented several times, couldn't have been a more ambiguous, ambiguous way of uh, creating, conceptualizing, installing, and opening this exhibition. So somehow everything became a meta reflection of all the things that you're actually discussing. So I wanted to thank you uh, for your thoughtful work. And thank you, the three of you, to be for being here with us, Jansu, Afsar, and, and Zoe, and for all the thoughtful collaboration that has made this exhibition happen and that you can still visit for a few more days until we close the, the exhibition. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank once again, thank you, Maite, and thank you, Zoe, for this uh, once in a lifetime opportunity <laughs> that you uh, provided us. Thank you so much. We are uh, forever grateful. What a wonderful conversation. And of course, we are joined by the artists and our, and our speakers um, for, for questions from the audience. Um, and we do have our, our first question. Um, how, how did you decide on the format of a crate to present your work? And do you think the crates serve as equalizers to present the ambiguous design standards? Could you talk a little about that? Yeah, thank you very much for the questions. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the crates, uh, the, the, the design of the crate uh, is very plain. It is almost untouched. And uh, we did this deliberately in a sense that we always wa um, wanted to be a traveling institute, uh, taking our crates together with us and visiting schools, institutions, museums, wherever uh, it is possible. So it was part of our uh, pedagogical strategy too. Being, a, being an institute uh, and not a design of this, uh, meant that we had to reduce, tune down our uh, personal design, let's say, styles yeah. or um, influences. Uh, just like uh, a regular states, like broadcasting channel or, or a newspaper or an, any institution, we have tried to have a very specific uh, language for for the artifacts that we are uh, producing and we want them to be uh, replicable if we are not there if uh, John Su is no more the CEO uh, or if I'm no more the general secretary of the institute all of these things should be uh, open to uh, repeat and replicate Wonderful, thank you. Um, we, do, we do have another question. I know you touched a bit on this, especially at the end. Um, what has been the most challenging part of presenting an exhibition during this past year? Well, uh, with everything <laughs> except that the, the people that we collaborate, I mean, uh, Art Institute Chicago has an amazing team, uh, starting with our creator, Zoe Ryan, uh, back then, and then Maite uh, took over the lead, and everyone contributed so much to the uh, exhibition's uh, setting process and the planning process as well. So uh, for that, we were super lucky. But on the other hand, uh, it had been uh, affected by the COVID, 
and uh, we are only um, able to come visit our exhibition at this closing week uh, of this uh, six months period. But uh, again, uh, for the um, starting part, I mean, the first thing that is had been affected by the pandemic was not only our presence here, but uh, how we're going to organize the crates, how we're going to organize uh, or tune down the interactiveness of the exhibition itself. Because a uh, part of it uh, is very uh, designed or designated to be interactive, and they are um, desired to be uh, touched and experienced firsthand. But since it's uh, COVID is something that um, reduces the hand <laughs> uh, and everything, so that we need to, needed to design the, uh, let's say, the electronic parts of the crates. And for that, we have a COVID switch. And hopefully, after the pandemic ends, we are planning to push the button of this COVID switch and uh, take out the plexi uh, coverings so that they can be interactive once again. And the other part about the uh, pandemic, maybe we can say that um, we, from the beginning, we wanted to um, add a level of interaction, maybe not by touching, but somehow implying that this is an institutional exhibition so that you are being welcomed by our vir virtual presence. And it did work well, uh, with the pandemic measures, because even if we were there at the beginning, at the inauguration times, I mean, it wasn't changed much uh, so that we uh, utilize this uh, information center to welcome guests, even though we are very far away in a different time zone. <laughs> uh, I'd like to add, uh, there are, uh, although sometimes used for each other, um, ambiguity and uncertainty are uh, entirely different concepts. So we are, as, as human beings, we are more uh, better designed to deal with ambiguity. Mm -hmm. All of these concepts, all of the words we are using for to, to mark time, you to um, give a recipe or whatsoever, are, they are all ambiguous, but they don't frustrate us because we all uh, understand each other. What is difficult for us is uh, the concept of uncertainty, uh, like not being able to know when you are having that exhibition that you are going to have. Or for, for Maite, when she's installing this, she what she doesn't know is like, uh, I think two days, the, the museum will be closed. Uh, mm. So all of these things um, actually put, put this challenge uh, on us because uh, it makes uh, planning uh, a very, very difficult and also a coordinating very difficult. Um, I mean, if this, this exhibition is opening now in, in a different continent, this is a transatlantic exhibition, but it would have been as difficult as it was if it was somewhere in, in Anatolia, I believe, because uh, once the once pandemic hit, uh, all of our connection and all of our communication became um, uh, distant mm -hmm. and virtual. In such an environment, it, is, uh, it was an extra difficulty for us to uh, design and produce and install a very tactile, uh, real mm -hmm. <laughs> exhibition. Thank you for that um, response. My ticket, Zoe, any, any final thoughts to share? Um, I will just add to what this uh, Jan Swanabsar said that, I mean, although there were a lot of challenges because of the distance and opening and closing, I think there was not a more prepared exhibition to go through all these challenges and make them look natural and part of the exhibition in a way right like the best thing is like having the artists virtually present in the gallery as something that has been planned through in advance so it was one of the privileges despite covid 
And the other one was even when we had to close, sometimes when we had to close to all the different closures with COVID, it really puts a lot of challenges to even our conservators, right? When we have to close everything, we need to cover things because they're going to be there for longer than expected. Uh, so it requires a lot of infrastructure. So it's always a part of tension, right, for everyone. And in this case, for this exhibition was not even an issue. We just needed to literally close the crates because everything was so well prepared and thought through that even the challenges looked like easy. So um, I think despite that, we all made it safely and make it look at, like everything was planned, which probably <laughs> put the note <laughs> of the irony that both of them usually make a very smart use throughout the whole work. Good job, everybody. It looks <laughs> absolutely beautiful. My only question would be, having now developed this exhibition and taken the project, you know, this far, where do you hope the project will go next? Mm. Well, <laughs> um, we have a couple of ideas. And first of all, we are very much dedicated to turn this project into a book. Uh, a proper book because, I mean, we, besides the crates and uh, besides what we are showing in the, in the galleries, uh, there is so much going on at the background in terms of its research and its connections with different uh, standardized um, products or their documentation. So it definitely uh, goes into a book. Um, so the, our plan is to somehow mm -hmm. realize it and manage to do it. And this, the funny part, I would say that we are hoping to get an ISO 9000 certificate for our institute, which is the uh, quality um, certification uh, given by ISO International Standards Organization. So we are wondering if we are quality enough to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to get it. Maybe we can try this as, an, as a part of our experimentation. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Good luck. <laughs> yes, we, we look forward to the book. Um, yeah. th thank you all again. Thank you, Jansu and Afshar and Maite and Zoe. And thank you all for joining us for this evening's program. We hope you get a chance to visit the exhibition Ambiguous Standards Institute, an institute within an institute, which is on view through Monday, June 7th. For more information on upcoming virtual events, please visit us online at artic.edu and look for our monthly e-news in your inboxes. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, everyone.